if I were to tell you that just taking carrots, dropping them into this jar of water and adding some salt and letting it sit at room temperature, lightly closed for about a week, will produce something astonishingly delicious and tasty, far more nutritious than the carrots that went in. Would you believe me? And would you believe me if I told you that the exact same process produces this creamy yogurt? Let's understand the science of fermentation. All life on this planet is engaged in a constant battle for calories. Plants figured out that they could just bypass this rat race by directly converting sunlight and carbon dioxide that we breathe out into plant mass. Some animals eat plants and just skip all the hard work. Think about it. Right? A potato takes months to grow underground and we get all those calories in just a few minutes. And then there are animals that eat other animals and get high quality protein directly. But what we're forgetting is that there is another more pervasive form of life. It's in our hands. It's on the skins of grains and legumes. It's in the skins of vegetables. In fact, there are 35 times more bacteria and six times more fungi than the weight of all the animals on the planet. So when we sign a high level strategic cooperation agreement between some bacteria and fungi and ourselves, we call it fermentation. In fact, all life is ultimately fermentation waiting to happen. When we like it, we call it fermentation and when we don't like it, we call it rotting or spoilage. By introducing some of these friendly bacteria and fungi to our foods, what we're essentially saying is, hey, here's this buffet of complex carbohydrates and proteins that I would like you to partially eat and break them down into sugars and amino acids. At that point, I'm gonna say, thank you for your service, and then proceed to eat your half-eaten meal and kill you in the process, or cook your half-eaten meal and kill you in the process. In a nutshell, fermentation is about allowing bacteria and fungi to break down complex elements of your food into simpler, more easily digestible things. You might wonder why, but no chef on the planet can do what bacteria and fungi can do to your food at a molecular level. It is in fact the oldest form of molecular gastronomy. And in general, smaller molecules are more easily detected by our tongues and by our noses, which is why fermented food is almost always more flavorful than its unfermented version. In this video, we'll focus on lactobacteria. There are more bacteria in this cup of yogurt than there are people in India. So let's try and understand how a cup of liquid milk turns into this thick and creamy yogurt. Lactobacteria are microbes that digest starches and sugars with enzymes like we do and generate carbon dioxide like we do. So let's see how yogurt is made. We prepare the milk for this process. Milk is mostly water, fats and protein. And there are two kinds of protein in milk, casein and whey. Whey is something you might be familiar with from gurgaon types in the gym. It is the casein that forms the thick, almost solid, creamy structure in yogurt. But to do that, we first have to denature it so that when it sets, it sets in a single structure as opposed to small crumbly bits of curd, which we do not want. So we need to heat the milk till it almost boils over. Note that when we boil milk for coffee, we don't overboil the milk because overboiled milk does not have the slick mouthfeel that we like in coffee. If you add the bacteria now, they will die a horrible death. So we let the milk cool down till it's about 40 degrees Celsius, also known as Delhi summer room temperature. That's the temperature that bacteria absolutely love. We introduce a small population of lactobacteria from a previous batch of yogurt. You only need a tiny amount. Using a large amount, is like opening the gates of Delhi to the Mongol army. The idea is to make the bacteria work hard to be fruitful and multiply. That gets us a more pleasant tasting yogurt. So now we keep this aside for anywhere from five to 16 hours. The bacteria will proceed to eat the sugars in milk, typically lactose, and convert it into lactic acid, which is what gives yogurt its sour taste. The lactic acid then proceeds to curdle the milk, much like how vinegar or lime juice curdles milk into paneer, lactic acid curdles your milk into yogurt. The advantage of using fermentation to curdle milk 
is the fact that the bacteria consume most of the sugars. So your final product yogurt is much more healthier than something like paneer, where the acid directly curdles the milk. Enjoy the delicious, fresh and creamy yogurt. The creaminess will depend on the amount of fat in the milk that you use. If you use high fat milk, you'll get a very thick and creamy yogurt. Um, and it's a matter of personal taste. Typically for mixing with rice, a lower fat yogurt is preferred, but for using in chaat or marinating meat, a higher fat yogurt is preferred. What do you do if you do not have yesterday's yogurt as a starter culture? No worries, lactobacteria are everywhere. All you have to do is use the stalk of a chili or some ginger peel to get going. There's enough lactobacteria on the surfaces of these. Now that you understand this process, you can use it to ferment pretty much anything you want, as long as it has enough starches or sugars for the bacteria to feed on. As I showed you at the start, you can lacto-ferment vegetables like carrot, beetroot, or radish. They actually turn pleasantly sour and have far more nutrition than the raw vegetables themselves because the bacteria break down complex molecules into simpler, more bioavailable ones. You can lacto-ferment fruits like amla or jamun, which tend to be quite sour, and fermentation actually improves their flavor and nutrition. This, in fact, is the principle behind lacto-fermented pickles. The principle here is to use 2% salt in terms of the total weight of water plus your ingredient. Why do we use salt? Especially when we know that salt actually kills bacteria by osmosis, meaning that the salt goes inside and water comes out till the salt concentration is balanced on both sides. That's why salt is a preservative. But lactobacteria, it turns out, can tolerate a small amount of salt. So adding 2% salt keeps all the nasty bacteria and fungi out while allowing lactobacteria to thrive, which is exactly what we want. You can even combine ingredients. In fact, if you ferment onions, garlic, chilies, and a fruit of your choice, perhaps something like pineapple, in about three weeks, you can make astonishingly high quality hot sauce far better than anything that you can buy in the store. If you take cabbage, add salt and let it ferment, in a few weeks, it will turn into sauerkraut, which is a fantastic German condiment. In fact, if you take cabbage, spring onion, chilies, radish, carrot, add some salt and squeeze the cabbage till it generates enough water to submerge all of your ingredients and just let it ferment for two to three weeks, you get kimchi. Why do we submerge our ingredients in water? It's because we actually want anaerobic fermentation. Lactobacteria actually convert lactose into lactic acid in the absence of oxygen. The presence of oxygen actually encourages other aerobic bacteria and fungi, which we do not want. Once you're done fermenting, the water in which you fermented your ingredients is liquid gold. You can actually use it to add a pleasantly salty and sour taste uh, that's very high on umami in any dish that you make, so don't throw it away. Last but not the least, let's look at the other most common example of lacto-fermentation in this part of the world, idli and dosa batter. The idea here is that the lactobacteria live on the surface of urad dal, not on the surface of rice, which tends to be polished and largely devoid of microbes. In fact, some of the oldest recipes of idli we know from about 1,000 years ago use only urad dal as an ingredient and no rice. Uh, rice was added as an innovation much later to make the idli softer in texture. An idli made only from urad dal will be pretty dense. So here's the algorithm for idli and dosa batter. We soak the dal and rice separately. We actually add a tiny bit of fenugreek. Fenugreek is our insurance in case your urad dal is quite old and the bacteria on it is not healthy enough. So what fenugreek brings to the party is some extra lactobacteria uh, on its surface. If you want an even softer idli, you can also add a little bit of soap poha. Grind the fenugreek and the urad dal separately from the rice and then mix them together, add 2% salt and then let it ferment for anywhere from 5 to 12 hours. How will you know when it's fermented? You'll smell it. And what is that pleasant smell you actually get? What happens is that in addition to bacterial fermentation of your batter, there's also a tiny bit of yeast which produces alcohol and that's what you're actually smelling in a well-fermented idli batter. At this point, you can actually refrigerate it because that will slow down biological activity and it will slow down the rate of fermentation as a result. I want to end this video by saying this. There's a common tendency in this part of the world uh, to say things like, oh, our ancestors knew everything about the science of fermentation and so on. And 
what that actually misses is the distinction between tacit knowledge and scientific understanding of that tacit knowledge. You see, ancient human beings, over thousands of years of experimentation in the kitchen, figured out the tacit knowledge of what will not kill you. Right? And so when human beings do that at scale, eventually you have tacit wisdom about what's good for you. It's not because they understood the concept of vitamin bioavailability by lactobacteria in your gut microbiome. That's the modern scientific understanding of what is tacit wisdom. You don't need scientific understanding to do fermentation in your kitchen. But at the same time, the tacit wisdom of how it works is not the same as the scientific understanding of how it works. Both are important. You can have a practical knowledge of fermentation without having a scientific understanding of it, but they're not the same thing. If you enjoyed this video and want to dig deeper, buy my book, Masala Lab, The Science of Indian Cooking, and I'll see you in the next video.